Amen. So keep your place there in Genesis chapter 18. That's going to be our, our core verse for um, the sermon this morning. So both um, tonight, or I'm sorry, this morning and tonight, and we're going to be studying kind of the, the idea of fatherhood um, and, you know, how, um, what the Bible says about these things this morning. And we're going to do that through a couple of different series that I've been in in the past. And this morning, um, we're going to do a sermon in the How Stuff Works um, sermon series. So the How Stuff Works sermon series is, you know, just basically talking about what the Bible says about how things are. The interesting thing, and one of the reasons I started this sermon series is because the Bible, you know, the thing about the Bible is you don't have to believe in the Bible. You don't have to be a Christian. You don't have to be saved in order for the Bible to be real and true and, and things to work that way. And that's really what I'm going to show you um, a really good example of this morning. You know, example, I mean, just the base core gospel example is heaven and hell are real, whether you think that they are or not. Whether somebody thinks heaven and hell is real, they're, they're real, and they, everyone will find this out one day. So, you know, with everything, though, even not just the gospel and, and salvation, everything in the Bible, even to the core details of, of how men should be, how women should be, how children should be, the structure of the family, the bottom line is the way the Bible lays things out, this is how it's going to work. This is how it works, whether you follow it or not. And I'm going to show you this morning how it's just proven that it works this way, whether or not people believe it or not. So, I mean, the idea is with everything that the Bible talks about from salvation to every manner of life, we, sh we should just get with the program. I mean, things are going to go better for us if we just get with God's program. Even how nations, even how nations work and how nations, you know, end up. It's like, look, if, if you go this way, it's going to go well for you. If not, this is what's going to happen. It's really amazing that, that man and nations and leaders keep repeating the same things over and over when it's all laid out in the Bible. This is how it works. The Bible works whether we like it or not, whether we believe it or not. So this morning on Father's Day, I want to give a sermon and look at what the Bible says about how fatherhood works, how fatherhood works. So we're going to look at, you know, what the Bible says about fatherhood, and just I'm going to show you from just secular studies and research that everybody knows about. I'll give you some shocking statistics this morning that basically prove that this is how fatherhood, fatherhood works, whether you believe it or not. Whether you follow it or not, it works this way. So let's get into it. Look at Genesis chapter 18. So here in Genesis chapter 18, God and two angels are on their way to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. They stop and they visit Abraham. And the context of this conversation is, you know, should God tell him, um, you know, God is saying, should I tell Abraham what I'm about to do, what I'm going to go do? And that's where you get into the discussion where Abraham is, is talking about, well, you know, there could be righteous people there, and they go from 50 down to, you know, 10, right? But look at verse number 17. This is what God says about Abraham, and this is very telling. This is a very good few verses right here about what a father's role is, all right? And look what God says here in verse 17. It says, And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Saying, Should I go tell him what I'm about to go do to Sodom and Gomorrah? Seeing that Abraham surely shall shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him. And he's saying, why is that going to happen? Why is verse 18 going to happen? And he's saying, for, th this is why it's going to happen, in verse number 19. And you're going to keep your place in Genesis 18 throughout the sermon, because we're going to come back to these verses at the very end of the sermon. So you're going to bookmark this place. But he says, this is why... Verse 18 is going to happen. This is why he'll be a great and mighty nation, and all the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. So the Bible says something very telling about Abraham here in verse number 19. The Bible says that because of what he does in verse number 19, these good things are going to happen to him. What are those good things? Look at verse number 19. Look at this word that he says in verse number 19. He says that Abraham will command his children and his household. This is showing us, you know, what the man's job is, what the father's 
job is in the family is to command his children and his household. He is to command his household. Look, he is to lead the way is what the Bible here. And it's not using a, uh, 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 a slight word here. It's not using a, a neutral word. It says he is to command it. Today, this is, you know, we're trying to erase this today. And there's something that I keep hearing that just keeps irritating the living daylights out of me, this idea and this term of co-parenting today. And I just keep hearing this just like, it's becoming like a common term today. This co-parenting. You say, what in the world is co-parenting? Well, shouldn't there be two parents? Well, yeah, you know, it kind of sounds okay at first until you realize, like, what it is. All right, look, at, I'm just going to read you um, a couple definitions of what co-parenting is, and then we're going to go back to the Bible. So here's a definition. I think, I, I don't know if this is from Wikipedia or where it is, but just like a definition of co-parenting. Co-parenting is an enterprise undertaken by parents who together take on the socialization, care, and upbringing of children from whom they share equal responsibility. You're like, that sounds pretty good, right? That's wrong right there. You got to be careful with this word equality today. They go, oh, everyone's equal today. No, not everyone's equal. And the Bible says that the man, as far as his responsibility in the family and raising the children, he does not have an equal responsibility. Let me continue. Married and cohabitation parents use this term, okay? Meaning, meaning married parents and parents that are just living in fornication, literally having children together, which is a, also a very common thing today. All right, we'll talk more about that tonight. It says children benefit from more co-parenting, but the amount of co-parenting varies between couples. So it's saying the more co-parenting you have, the better, okay? of this equal parenting. It says this certain study has found that the level of collaborative co-parenting was higher among, listen to this, was higher among unmarried cohabitation parents and among those who married in response to pregnancy compared to married couples that become pregnant during marriage. It's saying co-parenting is literally more common today in parents that aren't even married or parents that got married because of a uh, pregnancy. It's saying, like, this co-parenting. Sounds like I don't want to have anything to do with co-parenting. Now it gets weird, okay? It says, in a shared earning slash parenting, parenting, parenting marriage. See, this is really what co-parenting is. Co-parenting is there's a shared earning and parenting responsibility between both. It's equal. It's like, it's like both people are everything is what it's saying, Okay. It says, in, in this type of marriage, where there's a shared earning and shared parenting marriage, child care is divided equally or approximately equally between the two parents. In a parenting marriage, the parents live and raise their children together in a purpose-based marriage without physical intimacy or expectation to share mutual romantic love. You're like, what in the world? I mean, what, what is, this is, this idea of co-parenting, I just, I read you these weird things. So you just understand that it is, it is a complete rejection of the Bible. That, that's what this is. And that's what all of this stuff is. They're trying to take the man's role into some neutral status and take the woman's role up into some neutral status so neither man or woman is anything different or any... It's, it's literally equal, but that is not what the Bible teaches. The father is the leader, the Bible teaches. It is not equal. And here's the thing. Things, it's, it's not equal. Things that are different are not the same. A does not equal two. Two is not five. I mean, things that are different are not the same. Look, both are important. This is not saying that mothers don't have value. I mean, we know the value of mothers, but it's saying there are different roles. There are different specific roles roles in the Bible, and the Father is to be the leader, the commander of the family and his household. He is to be the leader of his wife and the leader of his children. That's what that is saying. He will command his children and his household 
after him. This is what God is saying. He's like, this is why he will be a great nation, because he will do this. It sounds like the opposite of a weak leader. If you look at the wording of this, he sets the rules, he sets the direction, and look back, look back at those verses, if you will, verse number 19. He sets the rules, he sets the direction, he sets, he leads the way in everything, is what the Bible is saying that Abraham will do, and a, a father should do. You say, how? In what way? Look at this. And they shall, in what way? In his own way? He will just make up whatever he wants? No, he will command this, he will command the way of the Lord is the way that he will command. He will command God's way. God gives us a way, and it is up to the man to command his household in that way. That's what the Bible is saying that Abraham will do, and this is why he will be a great nation. Now you say, what if we just erase this? What if we just erase this idea of the father commanding his household and we go into co-parenting and we go into everybody's this neutral status and it's just going to be you know here's how we're going to run this household we'll have a test case and we'll collaborate on everything and we won't have this strong you know this strong leader in the household well look this idea that there's no leader in a household is a major growing problem today it is a major growing problem society says society says today it doesn't matter if the man fills this role or the woman fills this role. That's what society is trying to teach us today, is it doesn't matter who fills whatever role. All roles can be the same. We don't need this biblical role. That's what society is trying to tell us today, all right, that men and women are equal. Men and women are not equal. That doesn't mean that they don't have value, but they are not equal. Things that are different are not the same. Look, I'm going to read you some shock statistics here. And every, here's the funny thing about this. As society is pushing this narrative that we don't need this father figure to lead the home, to command the home, well, you wouldn't find too many people use that wording today. We don't need the father to command the home. Look at statistics that literally everybody knows. These are so common, I'm not even, I mean, you can find these stats and these studies everywhere. And the ones I'm going to read to you, they're from, you know, they're from, oh, they're from far right wing uh, conservative uh, information centers like NPR, like the Department of Corrections, like the Census Bureau. I mean, the, the, these are just, these are such obvious things that are happening as a whole in our society that literally no one can deny them. Literally study after study after study is showing this. So we're trying to erase what the Bible is saying, but what society is finding out is that it works this way. It works this way whether we follow it or not. Like I said, that's the whole point of this sermon series, how stuff works. It's like, this is how things work, the Bible is telling us. We might as well get with the program. Because if we don't, here's some shockers for you. Here's some shockers, some st statistical facts. And look, notice, notice how when I read these stats to you, this doesn't have anything to do with whether you're Christian. It doesn't have anything to do with whether you're Muslim. It doesn't have anything to do with whether you're atheist. It doesn't have anything to do with what background, what your beliefs are, whether you believe one word of the Bible or not. It's just how it works. Why can't we learn? Why can't we figure this out? I'm going to read you some stats. Number one, 85% of youth. I've heard this one for 20-some years. I read books before I had kids. I wanted to read a bunch of books and figure out like, how to not be a bad parent, you know, so how to, how to be a good father. 85% of youth. I've heard this go from 80, anywhere from 85 to 95. I've heard different numbers, but it's like pretty much everyone. 85% of youth who are currently in prison grew up in a fatherless home. Another stat that I've heard is, is that the vast majority, 90, 95% of, of prisoners in prison hate their father. Fatherless home, different, different wording of the same type of stat. Number two, seven out of every 10 youth that are housed in state-operated correctional facilities, including detention and residential treatment, come from a fatherless home. Department of Justice, Department of Corrections. 
Number three, 39 percent. And when I read these stats, you think about these stats and you think if you're going you're gonna to draw some logical conclusions here, and that's okay. Use your head. Right? I mean, encourage, we, we should encourage more people in this country to use their head. 39 percent of students in the United States from the first grade to their senior year of high school do not have a father at home. That's almost 40 percent. Four in ten of kids right now today in school don't have a father at home. Children without a father without a father at home are four times more likely to be living in poverty than children with a father. So 40 percent of kids are four times more likely to be living in poverty than children with a father at home. Number four, children from fatherless homes are twice as likely to drop out from school before graduating than children who have a father in their lives. Number five, 24.7 million children in the United States live in a home where their biological father is not present. That equates to one in every three children in the United States not having access to their father. Number six, remember this one, because we're coming back to it. Girls who live in fatherless homes have a 100% higher risk suffering from obesity than girls who have a father present. Teen girls from fatherless homes are also four times more likely to become mothers before the age of 20. We're going to talk a lot about daughters and, and, and fathers here in just a few minutes. But notice that. Notice that 100% higher risk means double the chance, basically. Okay? Stat 7. In 2011, 44% of children in homes headed by a single mother were living in poverty. Almost half of single mother homes are, are living in poverty. Just 12% of children in married couple families were living in poverty. I mean, that's, that, should weigh, that should tell us something right there. Number eight, children who live in a single parent home are more than two times more likely to commit suicide than children in a two parent home. Number nine. 72% of Americans believe that a fatherless home is the most significant social problem and family problem that is facing their country. That gives me a little bit of hope. Number 10, 68% of children will spend their entire childhood with an intact family. Only 68% of children will spend their entire childhood with a mother and father in the home, is what that is saying. Number 11, living in a fatherless home is a contributing factor to substance abuse, with children from such homes accounting for 75% of adolescent patients being treated in substance abuse centers, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, fatherless home. I mean, whenever you get to that point of like 75%, 85%, you can say like, hey, we found it. Hey, we found you know, the causing factor here. Look at this one. 85% of all children which exhibit some type of behavioral disorder come from a fatherless home. U.S. Department of Justice. Here's another one, 13. 90% of youth in the United States who decide to run away from home or become homeless for any reason originally come from a fatherless home. Hey, found it. Verse four, uh, not verse 14, item four, uh, stat 14. 63% 63 of youth suicides involve a child who is living in a fatherless home. 15, children who live in a single parent or step family home report less school monitoring, less social supervision, and lower educational expectations than children who come from two-parent homes. 16, when the poverty levels are equal, children who come from a two-parent home outperform children from a one-parent home. 17, a recent study by Richard Reeves and Kimberly Howard finds that parenting skills across demographic groups. Now, I didn't go and look at what these demographic groups are. It means like, you know, race groups or whatever, you know, which I, I don't really care about. It says, parenting skills across demographic groups and found that 44% of single mothers fall into the weakest category and only 3% into the strongest category. Meaning only 3% of single mothers fell into the strongest demographic group while 44% fell into the weakest demographic groups. Look at number 18. About 40% of children in the United States are born to mothers who are not married. That's, that's shocking right there. Meaning there's almost one out of two, almost half the children in the United States right now 
is, so whenever we talk about that people aren't getting married anymore, it doesn't mean they're not having kids anymore. So almost half the kids in the United States today that are born, their parents aren't married. Over 60% of these children were born to mothers who were under the age of 30. Now, wait a minute. Remember number six? Remember number six? Let me reread for you number six. It says teen girls. So it's basically saying 60% of these children are born to mothers under the age of, of 30. Young, single mothers. Item six was this. Teen girls from fatherless homes are four times more likely to become mothers before the age of 20. What's the common denominator here? It's a fatherless home. You know, what the, you, you know what these stats are telling us? These stats are telling us that fatherless daughters beget fatherless sons and daughters. That's what this is saying. If you put these things together, look, much is made of males without fathers. And we'll talk about that in a, a few minutes. But fathers and daughters, this is super important because these, these social studies that have nothing to do with the Bible, nothing to do with God's truth, are telling us this. They're telling us that fatherless homes create fatherless homes. And if you just take that one tiny step further, fatherless homes create single mothers. That's what studies are showing us here. You say, why is that? Isn't that in the Bible somewhere? You would think that would be in the Bible somewhere. Turn to Numbers chapter 30. Turn to Numbers chapter 30. The Bible covers this. The Bible talks about this, about this connection between a father and his daughter. Look at Numbers chapter 30, and I want to read this for you, and I want to explain to you how this works this morning. Because this works whether you think it works or not. This works whether you've read this page or not. This works. Even these studies are showing us that this is how it works. Look at Numbers chapter 30 and look at verse number 2. Talking about the relationship between a father and his daughter in Numbers chapter 30. In verse number 2, and we're using the example here of a vow that a daughter has made. Okay, It says, if a man vow a vow unto the Lord, or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. It's saying, if a man promises something and vows a vow, he owes it. That's it. That's why Jesus says, hey, don't take oaths. He's like, just say what you'll do and do what you'll say. You know, and, and it, you know, don't promise things you're not going to do. Jesus is saying, just let your yay be yay and your nay be nay. Because if you vow a vow, you owe it as a man. But the woman has protection. The woman has someone looking out for her. Look at this. It says, as a woman, also vow a vow unto the Lord. And this will show you, look, this will also show you how much God values women. This will show you how much God values young ladies, how he is. Look, God has literally provided protection for, for ladies from the time they are young to the time that they are old. He has provided this protection because, look, he knows they're, they're weaker. He knows they're more vulnerable. So he has put in place protection for them. And it works this way whether we like it or not. We might as well follow the Bible. Look at verse number three. If a woman also vow a vow. Now, it's, the rules are different here. Vow vow unto the Lord and bind herself by a bond, being in her father's house in her youth. So it gives very specific directions of a young lady who's still living with her parents and her father is there. It says, her father hear her vow and her bond wherewith she, ha she hath bound her soul and her father shall hold his peace at her then all her vows shall stand, and every bond wherewith she had bound her soul shall stand. And saying if she goes and she makes uh, a promise or she vows something, and her fa it has to go through her father first. Why? Because he is there to protect her. He is there to make sure that she is not taken advantage of. Make sure that she is not out there listening to somebody and making foolish promises, getting manipulated by somebody who's saying, hey, you should come over here and do this or whatever. It's like your father will, will, will go through those vows and he will say no. And she is not bound at all because her father is there 
her father is put in place as a protector for her. Look at verse number 5. But if her father disallow her in the day he heareth, not any of her vows or of her bonds wherewith she, she shall be bound her soul. She'll stand. It's like they're just voided. He, he has veto power. And the Lord shall forgive her because her father disallowed her. This isn't about, like, who's better? I mean, are you crazy? Are you listening to this? This is about protecting the weaker vessel. This is about protecting the daughter in, in, this, in this wicked nightmare of a world out here that will destroy anything. Where Satan's operating freely out here, what's the first thing getting destroyed? It's the women and the children out here. But here the father is to protect his daughter. This is his duty, the Bible is saying. Look at verse 6. Oh, but what happens when, you know, she, she's no longer living with her father? Look at this. And if she had an all in husband when she vowed, or uttered out of her lips, where was she bound her soul? And her husband heard it and held his peace at her in the day that he had heard it, then her vow shall stand, and her bounds, where was she bound her soul, shall stand. Now, it, it's, it, the duty passes to the husband. Why? Why does the duty pass to the husband? Because... Because God wants to make sure that these ladies are protected for their entire life. That's why. God wants to make sure that these weaker vessels are protected throughout their life. The philosophy, look, the philosophy is, is a philosophy of protection, is the philosophy here. And it passes, there is a seamless transition. There is a seamless transition from a young lady whose father is protecting her, and then she gets married, and she is protected then by her husband. But the point is, the man is responsible for the protection of the daughter. The man is responsible for the protect protection of the young lady. Her dad protects her. Look, this is Ephesians. This is, this is part of the nurture and admonition of the Lord in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 4. The nurture of our daughters is this protecting feature that a father has. This idea that, you know, he will protect her, he will nurture her in the Lord, and she will be protected from any evil, anything that is going to try to harm her. Which there's plenty that's trying to harm our daughters out there today. There's plenty of wicked philosophies and wicked people that would just love to harm young ladies today. We'll talk more about that tonight. But the point I'm trying to get you to understand is this is the value of a father's relationship with his daughter. A young lady with this nurture, with this protecting person in place, whether it be her father and then her husband, she will not go looking for things and go looking for affection and looking for this protection in the wrong places. Because just as it's our role to protect, it is, it is that young ladies, it's wired in her to be protected. It's wired in her to want to be protected and look for someone that is going to give that nurture to her. A young lady with a strong, protective, a strong father that is commanding his household, commanding his children, she will not go looking for the wrong type of male affection. That's what the Bible is telling us here. She will not, and look what those studies told us, she will not end up in fornication. She will not end up a single mother. This is how it works. She will not end up in these terrible situations because she was protected and nurtured, and that is the father's role. That is not the mother's role, to be that protector. That is the father's role. So a nurturing father commanding, commanding his household in the way of the Lord will protect his daughter. Will protect his daughter. He will, he, will, he will deliver, and then he will deliver his daughter into the arms of a loving husband that will then protect her the same way he did. Here's, here's, more, here's another interesting thing that everybody knows. Here's another interesting thing that everybody knows. You say, wow, the Bible sounds pretty smart, but here's the thing. Everybody knows this. So why are they teaching all this anti-father stuff today when all of these studies, are these people idiots? No, it's satanic. It is definitely a spiritual war, folks. Because there's no other reason that all this information, like all these shock statistics that I told you this morning, and then this common knowledge that I'm about to read you, there is no other reason that people would just ignore it. 
if it wasn't a spiritual battle. Here's some more common stats. When it comes to picking a partner, different people seek different attributes. Some look for, and you can find this, I'm not going to read the source because you can find this data almost everywhere. If you Google this, you will come up with so many results you will not be able to read them in, in five hours. When it comes to picking a partner, I hate that word too, different people seek different attributes. Some look for specific phys physical attributes, say height, skin color, weight. Some go for temperament or emotional qualities, while others, especially women, simply look for their fathers. Translation, women marry someone like their dad. Here's another quote from another study. Studies show that a lot of women end up dating or getting married to men who have certain recognizable similarities with their fathers. Well, this often happens at a subconscious level. No one goes around comparing their potential um, you know, husband against their father's personality attributes. These women end up settling with men who are in one way or another, who at one way or another resemble their fathers. From the New Scientist, here's another, um, another addition onto this. It says, women tend to choose husbands who look like their fathers. <laughs> Even if they're adopted, reveals a new study. The point is this. Young ladies, the vast majority marry someone like their dad. Good or bad? Good or bad? Abusive father, someone that's just, you know, they, they marry that same type of person. I'm sorry, but that's how it works. That's how it works. That's how important the father's role is. This is why, this is why, this is why the Bible is telling us in Genesis 18, 19, that Abraham, he will command his family. The Bible says that the men should be strong. Quit ye like men, be strong. You say, what, 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 what do you mean be strong? It means be physically strong, be emotionally strong, and be spiritually strong. It means be strong. And guess what? This is why young ladies that have a strong father, that is the Numbers chapter 30 father, that is there to just protect her, look out for her. Just, he is just strong. He commands his household in the ways of the Lord. This is why, and you, 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 you know ladies like this, you know young ladies like this, this is why young ladies that have fathers like that, they are disgusted by weak men. Amen. Yeah. That's what you want. Because guess what? You know what strong men? Strong men are disgusted by this weak man that's being pushed today. Strong men are, are disgusted. It, it's like it just nothing's more irritating than an effeminate man to a strong man, a strong physical man, a strong emotional man, and a strong spiritual man. And daughters will be the same way. Like, uh, 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 we should raise our daughters to the point where some weakling, it makes them sick to their stomach. That's how it should be. Because they're looking, they're looking for someone who's going to fill that role of that strong protector. This is how it works. This is how it works. This is also why, this is also why, and I've seen this several times in my life. You know, I'm getting older now. I think my wife called me old yesterday. We're driving, we're doing follow-ups and, and we're driving up. We always, I, I like doing follow-ups. We just drive around. It's a time I get to talk to my wife where there's no, you know, chaos of life going on and, and we're doing follow-ups and we always, right, we get to the house or whatever. Um, I always say, is it a man or a woman? If it's a man, I'll go to the door. If it's a woman, um, my wife will go to the door. And I said, is it a man or a woman? She said, it's an older man. He's about 50. I'm like, what are you trying to say? <laughs> I'm like, did you just call me old? But anyway, that's, that's my problem. Anyway, um, here's another reason. Here's another reason that you'll see a certain thing. And if you're a little bit, I've seen this several times in my life, but daughters, this is why when a father gets old, and a father gets old and frail and sick, it is the daughters that have the hardest time with it. You say, why is that? It's because she remembers him as strong. It's because when she thinks of her father, she thinks of the strength. Just the 
man, I remember how, how strong my dad used to be. And she remembers that, that leader. She remembers that commander. She remembers that person that could just do things that just like, man, just my dad can just do anything. My dad can fix anything. He can lift anything. And then they see, you know, their dad old, maybe in a hospital bed or something, and it, it is very difficult for the daughters to see that. But, but that's a good thing. It's a good thing that, that she remembers the strength and that she remembers the power and, and the commanding attribute of her father because that means that that's who he was. And we're not always going to be physically strong. But that's why you see the daughters just get hit with that. But it's good because they remember their father as a strong, commanding leader. It's vital. It's vital that the father is strong in everything. It is literally the, folks, it is literally the defining factor for success and failure of the next generation. I mean, with our daughters, it's teaching them how to be treated, how to be protected, what to look for in their husband. And sons, I mean, I don't want to just totally just dismiss the sons, but sons, it's teaching them how to protect and teaching them how to be that husband and how to be that father. When I am, am you know, my, my marriage counseling to my sons is living my life with my wife. That is, I mean, when I, when I, when I see my sons get married, I, what, what more can I say to them? Because my life was their, their marriage counseling. This is how you treat a wife. This is how you protect your wife. This is how you support your family. This is how you raise strong children. This is how you do it. And look, you can't go back. You can't have your children getting married and then say, oh, I'm going to go back and, and, and be that, that leader. No, it's done at that point. You're training them both for marriage, daughters and sons, by being this commanding father who commands his household, children and wife, in the ways of the Lord. You say, you know, I, I don't want to make people feel bad today, but I mean, you say, what if I didn't have this? What if I didn't have this? Am I just toast? Turn to Psalm chapter 68. No, God has a plan B for you. God has a plan B for you. There is still success for you. You say, I didn't have this strong father that you're talking about. I didn't have this strong spiritual leader who commanded his household in the ways of the Lord. If you have it, you thank God every day that you have it. Because not a lot of people have it. You say, what if, but what about all the people, maybe the majority of people that don't have it? Especially in this country. What about the majority of people that don't have it? Are they just, are they just done? Is there no hope for them? No. Look at Psalm chapter 68. Look at verse number 4. Psalm chapter 68 Verse number four, God has a plan for you, and this is how that plan works. This is how plan B works if somebody failed in that position that was supposed to be your father leading his family in the ways of the Lord. Sing unto God. Sing praises to his name. Extol him that rideth upon the heavens by his name, Jah. That's just a, a short for uh, Jehovah. And rejoice before him. It's talking about God here, and look at verse number five. It calls God this. It says, a father of the fatherless and a judge of the widows is God in his holy habitation. You see, in verse number five, there's a missing man here. And God is saying, look, God's acknowledging that there's a missing man here. God's acknowledging the 40% of the households today that have a father that's missing. God is acknowledging the weak man that's not going to, you know, command his family in the ways of the Lord. God's acknowledging that there's a missing man here. Look, there's many different ways that there, there could be uh, a single household. There's many different reasons. Maybe uh, a father died. Maybe there was a divorce. Maybe, you know, he just, he left. Maybe he was, you know, not a good man. There's lots of that. It doesn't matter why, though. Because in verse number five, God is saying, I will be a father. I am. He's saying, I am a father to the fatherless. That's what God is saying. And look at verse number six. 
It says, God setteth the solitary in families. He bringeth out those which are bound with chains, but the rebellious dwell in dry land. God is saying, God is saying, let me just translate that for you. God is saying that if you are, you didn't have this, you didn't have a good father, God will set your way. God will show you. God will step in to the fatherless. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. You say, okay, he'll guide my way, but I'm alone. He'll guide my way, but I have a Bible, but that's not a person. That's not someone that can, you know, you know give me a hug and, and be a father to me, like a father that I should have had. But yeah, but God gave you the Bible, but he also gave you other things. God tells you he'll set your way. He'll set your path. You have the Bible, and he, he's, he's not just going to leave you. He's not just going to leave you on your own with his word. Look at verse number 11 of Ephesians chapter 4. Verse number 11, it says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Why? Why did So God is literally saying that he'll be a father to you if you're fatherless, but he's saying, I've given you all these people. I've given you all these other men in your life. Prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, which you all are. Till we all come in unity of the faith and to acknowledge the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure and the stature and fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro. You know what God is saying? God is saying, I'm going to set your way. I'm going to set your way, and I'm going to give you these people these prophets and pastors and teachers in your life to help you, to protect you, so you won't be tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men. He's saying, I'll provide that protection for you, is what he's saying. He's saying, here's the substitute right here. He's saying, the word of God is the substitute. My word is the substitute. The pastor is the substitute. The prophet, the teachers... Because there's many people in cunning craftiness out there. They're just laying in wait to just deceive you and destroy you. But God's saying, I've provided a path for you and protection for you. God loves the fatherless. He literally said, I will substitute for that. He said, I never, you know, if I never had a father or he was terrible, father, look, I'm sorry. That was not God's plan for you. But, I mean, this is, this is the dark side of free will, is that some men will be bad men. Some men will scar their conscience. Some men will leave. Some men will not do the right thing. Some men will not be fathers. Some men will be terrible fathers. Some men will do wicked things. That is not on you. That wasn't your fault. That was his fault. And he will be held accountable for that. God, God will hold him accountable. But God has a plan B, and God's saying get in church. God's saying get in the right church. That, that's the hardest part of this, by the way, is, is getting in a church that's following the Bible. God is saying get in the right church, follow the Bible, be faithful. Be faithful and God will set your way. It's like God gave you this. God gave you this. Just get in church. And I, I, I wish I, I've, I've, I've told many young men this. Just get in church and do whatever the pastor tells you if you never had a father. Just do it. Ask questions. Follow directions. But look, I've seen many young men and young women over the years who came from fatherless or terrible father situations. Many, many, more than I can even think of. It's a common thing, unfortunately. I've seen many more successes with the young women, though. The young women and the young men that never had a father and then get in a church like this or a similar church that teaches the Bible like we do here. They get in church, they be faithful to the Lord, and, and look, the Lord will be a father to the fatherless to you. 
But I've seen many more successes with young women in this case. I mean, I've seen so many successes with young women in this case. They go on to, the, they're, they, they get in church, they're faithful, they're faithful to church, they're faithful to the house of God, they end up getting married to a, a, a strong Christian man, and they go on to have a great marriage and a successful Christian life. I've seen so many successful successes with young women there. And I believe, this is, this is my thought on this, but I believe, I've asked myself, why is there so many successes with young ladies in that category, but not with young men? And I believe that it's because it's, it's hardwired. Women are, women are by nature followers. Women are by nature looking for a leader. And the woman that finds that proper church and finds the Lord gets saved and gets in a church and then follows um, and is faithful to that church and listens to the word of God that she's reading and she's hearing preached, listens to godly counsel that she's receiving through a, a, a strong man of God who is leading from the Bible. They, they're just, they're looking for a leader and they found the right one in those cases. And that's why they're successful. With young men, it, and many, like, may, for with many young women, it, it seems easy for them. <laughs> It seems easy for them, it, it, no matter what background they came from. I wish more young ladies would, would throw off. I wish we could reach more and more young ladies that are being destroyed by the philosophies of this world, and we could get them saved and get them into church, and, and we would have just great successes there. But it's young men that struggle here that, that I've seen in my experience. It is young men that struggle here. They, they grew up from... Almost every single young man that I've seen have trouble in church comes from a home that did not have a father or had a bad father. It's not an accident. They all have this, they all have this, these stats, just like we saw, they all have it in common. Almost all of them. It's 90%, just like the, the studies we saw. But with the young men, the reason that they have a more difficult time getting into church, being faithful, getting right, following the advice of a pastor, and, and just like learning how to be a strong leader is because they are by nature a leader. These young men are by nature a leader, and they don't know how to lead. So they're like a rocket without fins, the, these young men. And if they can't, if, if they've never been taught authority in their life, and they've never been taught that, you know what, some authority is ordained by God in your life, and if they can't accept that, they're never going to be able to be taught how to be that godly, commanding leader. We're going to talk about the young men more in detail tonight. Um, so I'm not really putting a lot of time on young men. But many people with, many of these young men with father problems cannot stay in church. And it's really sad. It's really sad. They can't listen to authority. The thing is, if, the thing is folks, if God gives you a solution and you don't take it, or you reject that solution, then this is where the victim becomes the perpetrator. At some point, the victim becomes the criminal in these cases. Because as you become adult, you're, you're, you're responsible for the things that you do and the people that you harm. So look, folks, in conclusion, how fatherhood works. I hope you see the, the, the graveness of the situation this morning. None of this is to diminish the role of the mother. None of it. None of it. It's just a different role. It is a role that is not equal to. Look, it's just as women and men are as highly valued to God spiritually. But that's it. They have different roles. The point I'm trying to get you to understand is that everything rises and falls on leadership, whether you like it or not. You say, I'm a father and I'm a husband and, you know, uh, and I don't like the fact that I have to, it doesn't matter. Your home will rise or fall on how you command or don't command your household. Uh, it, it's a massive responsibility that we have as fathers. Turn back to Genesis chapter 19. And the results, here's the difference between the man, the man's role here. Here's the real importance of it. The failure, the failure of the man will drag everyone down. The, his failure, the failure of the father to command his household in the ways of the Lord 
will be a failure for everyone. That is what those statistics were really saying. If we could sum up those statistics, it's that the children without the father fail. The, the daughter without the father will fail. The son without, without the father will fail. That is, that's what the Bible is telling us. Look at Genesis chapter 19. Look at verse number 18. Genesis chapter 19 and verse number 18. But this is what you have to ask yourself. This is what you have to ask yourself. Now that you know how fatherhood works, look at verse 18. It says, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. We know that's a, a reference to, you know, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. But look at that first part of the verse where it's saying, seeing that, that he shall become a great and mighty nation. Think about this for a second. What if you could become a great and mighty nation? I'm talking about you personally, Dad. What if you could command in such, a, in such a perfect way, according to the Bible, what if you could command the ways of the Lord in your family to the degree where generations after you, it would still be rippling through your family? What if generations after you still loved and served the Lord? You could become a great and mighty nation if you do exactly for what Abraham did because of how you commanded the way of the Lord in your family. But this, look, folks, this will not be achieved. Why are we trying to, why are we trying to take men? Why is Pastor Jones' sermon was titled today, The Mandemic? Why are we trying to take masculinity out of manhood? Why are we trying to remove the role of the father in families? The reason that it is trying to be, that, that Satan ultimately is trying to remove this role is because you will not become a great nation through weakness. Because Satan doesn't want you having children that raise children that raise children that raise children that all become soul winners, that all serve the Lord with their life. That's, that's a disaster for Satan. So he wants to weaken the man. He wants to weaken this. You will not command this through weakness. There are times when you will have to command things that are not popular. There are times when you will have to lead your family in things that maybe not everybody wants to go. Maybe not everybody, but you need to know what the ways of the Lord are, and you command your family in the way of the Lord no matter what through strength. That is what the Bible is saying. And look, you could become a great and mighty nation. It's, it's, a, huge, it's a huge undertaking. This was the problem in the Bible, that they couldn't pass their faith on to the next generation. This is the problem. It will not be achieved through uncertainty. It will not be achieved through a father that is leading one day and not leading the next. It will not be achieved. You will not be a great and mighty nation for generations to come if that's you. No, no, no. This is a man in Genesis chapter 18 and verse number 19. This is a man who is stable, who is solid, and who is strong. In what way? In every way. He'll lead his household with strength and certainty, raising sons and daughters who are left with no doubt on how they should prosecute their lives and bring up the next Christian generation. It's a big deal. That's how it works, whether we like it or not. And it's a massive responsibility. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.